So Galatians 6.1, I'm not going to say this time, this is our last lesson. Um, we're just going to see what the Lord does. But let's read our text one more time. Brethren, if a man, this is Galatians 6.1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And we added last week verse 2 to this discussion. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And by the way, there's only one way to fulfill the law of Christ. What is the fulfilling of the law? Do you guys remember that text? Love is the fulfilling of the law, right? So this is only accomplished through love. And we've tried to emphasize that throughout this discussion, that this is an act of love, right? When we talk about church discipline, this is not uh, an act of cruelty. Uh, this is not something that people take pleasure in doing. This is a, a grievous thing, and it's something that's done out of love because we care for the individual or the individuals uh, that this discipline is applied to. So I had a question last week after the message uh, when I thought I was done. And the question was, um, are you saying that this person is, if, if this person is separated from the church, that they are not permitted to be in the services? Because that's what it sounded like. And certainly we want this person to be presented the gospel, right? And, um, and so just to be clear, that's exactly what I meant last week. What I was saying last week is that this person is put out and they're not permitted here. But I appreciated the question because it gave me opportunity to reflect upon that. And as we discussed those things, the verse that was mentioned was something that we talked about in Matthew 18, where uh, we see the, the manner in which this, this church discipline, how you reach this point is there is an offense. It's dealt with one-on-one -on -one first. person won't listen. The person won't repent. So we take two or three. We address the issue again. They still won't repent. We bring the issue before the church. If they won't hear the church and repent of this sin, then let them be to you as a heathen and a publican. And so uh, the individual that mentioned this to me, I, I thought it was a great case. You know, it says we're there to be a publican and a heathen to us. We consider them to be an unbeliever. But does this mean that we put them out of the general assembly of the saints and they are not able to have the gospel presented to them in the assembly? And I said, you know, I haven't. Uh, and so uh, as we talk through that, I prayed about that, and I've been chewing on that all week long and, and asking the Lord, how would that work? God, what would that process be like if that's what it means? And, and I will, I'm gonna, the case that I'm going to present to you this morning is I believe still that the emphasis of the Word of God is to put this individual out of the assembly. And I want to I show you why I believe that that is the case. But I want to say that I appreciate you guys bringing these things to me. I really sincerely appreciate you uh, giving me your point of view when we don't see eye to eye, I need that. I need to be held accountable when it comes to the Word of God. And I appreciate the spirit with which you guys present these things to me. So I don't ever want you to feel like you can't address a particular topic and approach me. Um, there, I, I, I was listening to a man, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Paul Washer, but I remember listening to one, to one of his messages. And he was talking about how as a young Christ, Christian, he, was, I mean, he had just been saved, and uh, you know, a few months, some, maybe, uh, maybe a year or so, and he heard this man preach, and he said everything he, the guy was saying was just tremendous. I mean, he was just so greatly blessed. And he gets done, and he goes up and talks to the guy afterwards, and he shakes his hand, and he asks him about something that the guy uh, taught. And he said the guy was so offended that he would ask a question that suggested in some way, shape, or form that maybe, you know, he didn't have the right answer. And Paul Washer said, that's not what I was intended at all. He said, I was just asking him about, I was wanting to know more. I was wanting to grow and what, I was wanting to add to what he had said. And, and he said he never forgot that because the guy was so harsh and, and it was clear, don't question me. I welcome that, right? And we ought to desire that because we iron sharpens iron and we want to grow. And I tell you what, I don't have all the answers. And I hate to bring you down a notch or two. You don't either, right? <laughs> we all need to know things better than we know them right now. And so that's what our desire is as we read the Word of God and as we study therein. We want to come to the fullness of the truth and we want to grow. We all need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so as I began to chew on this, we looked at this text. And let's go to 1 Corinthians 5 again. Uh, one of our, our, our main texts throughout this study have probably been Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians 5. Those are the ones that deal most clearly with this issue of church discipline. 
But you know, the more that I chewed on it, the, the clearer to me I think that this passage is here concerning what needs to be done and the way that it's presented to us. And, and I, I just couldn't get away from the clarity of verse number 13 as he talks about, you know, verse 11, not keeping company with any man that is called a brother, right, that, that is involved in these sins. And, and he talks about uh, with such an one, no, not to eat in verse 11. There is a clear separation. Verse 13 says this, but them that are without God judgeth. In other words, those that are outside the church, those that are unbelievers, God judges those. He said, I'm not telling you to separate yourself from, you know, idolaters and fornicators and all these things that are in the world because you, you're just going to have to stay in a hole somewhere and not interact with anybody if that's the case. But he says, I am saying this is what needs to be done for any that calls himself a brother and is involved in these sins. And he says, therefore, in verse 13, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. That seems pretty clear to me. Put this person out. Verse 11 said, don't even eat with such an individual. And so I, I want you to see this same text in the Old Testament, okay? Uh, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13. There are multiple passages here in the book of Deuteronomy. And what we're going to see as we read these passages is, is that it's dealing with the same sin. Dealing with the same list of sins that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, fornication, uh, covetousness, idolatry, uh, extortion, uh, railers, drunkards. The same type of things are going to be dealt with in the book of Deuteronomy. And I want you to see what the consequence was and the manner in which they put this wickedness out from them. Put this evil away from them. Deuteronomy chapter 13 and in verse number 1. It says, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. We call that idolatry, right? He's encouraging idolatry within the camp. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. There's one place, and I can't remember if it was here, in similar text where he says, you know, the prophet prophesies this and it doesn't come to pass. Well, you know very clearly that that wasn't from the Lord. But he says, you know what? There's going to be times where they prophesy something and it is going to come to pass. And God said, it's going to be that way so that I will try you in that hour and see, do you really love me? Do you really believe what I say? What do we know is going to be the case uh, as we approach the Lord's return? There are going to be people that come in the name of Jesus Christ and they're going to do some pretty amazing things. They're going to do signs and wonders to the point that he says if it's even possible, that, that if it's possible, even the very elect should be deceived, right? So uh, it's like our brothers told us over and over again, gifts are not evidence of grace. Just because someone has the ability to do something doesn't mean that they're truly speaking on behalf of God. And so here they are being tried. The prophecy comes true, but God is trying them to see if they will love the Lord their God with all their heart and with all their soul. He says, you shall walk after the Lord your God, in verse 4, and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice, and ye shall serve Him and cleave unto Him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. Because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in, so shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. That was the commandment there to remove that evil from the midst of them. Uh, verses 6 through 11 in the same text. Here deals again with an idolater. And uh, uh, if thy brother, you know, this is, this is going to hit close to home. Sometimes this one that's trying to pull you away may be men of your own household, right? Uh, if thy brother, the son of thy mother, or any of these, uh, your son or your daughter or the wife of thy bosom, uh, uh, if they say... Uh, entice you secretly, it says at the end of the verse, let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers. If they participate in idolatry and have a desire to pull you away into this ungodliness, um, it says in verse number... Uh, 9, but thou shalt surely kill him, thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. Uh, and thou shalt stone him with stones. Verse 8 says, you shall not conceal him, you, will bring, you should bring this to light, because he hath sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God. Uh, verse 11, and all Israel shall hear and feel and fear and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. The sin was to be exposed and it was to be dealt with by death, that this might be put out from among them and that others might fear. And that's one of the things that we've seen in this, this uh, the point to church discipline is number one, it's, it's in obedience to God. 
Number two, it's for the benefit and the health of this individual that's involved in the sin because they need to be brought face to face with that reality. And number three, it's for the good and the benefit of the whole church. They need to be put out from the assembly so that this little bit of leaven, it says in 1 Corinthians 5, doesn't puff up the whole lump, right? So the way that they dealt with these sins in the Old Testament times is those people were actually put to death. Uh, chapter 17, uh, verse number 2, you've got someone that, that wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord and transgressing His covenant, verse 3, and has gone and served other gods. Um, so again, you have idolatry here at the mouth of two or three witnesses in verse 6. This person is put to death. That sounds familiar, the mouth of two or three witnesses. We've encountered that in our study. Uh, in verse 7, the hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people. And here's our language from 1 Corinthians 5. So thou shalt put the evil away from among you. Chapter 24, verse number 7. We talked about what it means to be an extortioner. Um, in, the, in our text in 1 Corinthians 5. If anyone calls himself a brother and he is an extortioner, and we said that meant to take by force, to rob and to steal and to take by force. Um, that's what you have here in, in Deuteronomy chapter 24 in verse number 7. You in essence have this sin of extortion. Uh, if, if a man be found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel and making merth, merchandise of him or selleth him, then that thief shall, be, shall die and you shall what? Away. Put evil away from among you, right? Same idea. Look at chapter 21. Uh, I, I meant to do this in order, and I don't know how these got out of order here. My computer does weird things. Uh, Matthew 20, uh, sorry, Deuteronomy 21 and verse number 20. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. That was one of the sins listed over there, right? Uh, anybody that calls himself a brother is a drunkard. And all the men of his, uh, of his city shall stone him with stones that he dies. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. And then finally in chapter 22, and in verse number 21, the first uh, of the list of things in 1 Corinthians 5 was fornication. And that's what you have in Deuteronomy 22 and verse 21. Uh, damsel that um, uh, the tokens of her virginity are not found in verse number 20. And so the men of her city shall stone her in verse 21 because she's wrought folly. What does the end of the verse say? So shalt thou put evil away from among you. You have uh, the sin of adultery in verse number 22. And again, they shall both die. So shalt thou put away the evil from Israel uh, in verse number 22. And then finally in verse number 23, uh, uh, more sins of fornication. And the, the, uh, the, what they have to do is put this, this one that has committed this sin to death. So sh thou shalt put away evil from among you. So what I wanted you to see was... Uh, the, 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 how, <laughs> how definite it was in the Old Testament, right? The responsibility was to put these individuals to death so that that evil be removed from you. They were, they were put outside, right, of the congregation, of the assembly. And why was that? Because God said if they remain there, they are going to pull others away after their sin. That's the trouble, right? That's, the, that, that's part of the main issue there in 1 Corinthians 5. You guys are prideful, and, and this, is, this is leaven that is among you. This evil that is festering among you is leaven. And if you put yeast in dough, the whole thing's going to rise, right? It's going to affect the entire lump. And so you need to put this out from you. So I'm thinking through this. I'm chewing through this. And, you know, if this sin is made public, if we're faithful to do what God says, and this sin is made public because repentance is repeatedly refused. Uh, and, and so this individual knows that in being put out, uh, the entire church has agreed against you. The entire church has said that what you're doing is sinful and wrong and you are in a state of denial and you need to repent. You're acting like an unbeliever. You're not acting like a believer. Remember, we saw that in 1 Corinthians 6. All of those lists of sins that we found in 1 Corinthians 5 were the list of the ones that were the unrighteous that will not inherit the kingdom of God in 1 Corinthians 6. So the entire church has agreed against this individual. First of all, it's unlikely that this person is going to come back without repenting. Right? Because everybody has said what he or she has done is wrong. Everybody has said that this is a sin that is, that is worthy of church discipline and, and the church has separated herself from you. 
The church has agreed against this person. This sin is so obvious that there is no denying it. And so I would say if this person wants to come back without repenting, this person's coming back to stir up trouble. All right, this person is coming back because he's going to start something. There's going to be division. There's going to be issues. There are going to be problems. And we've said something about sitting under the preaching of the Word of God. The worst place that you could be if you're not going to bow to the truth is to sit under the Word of God, right? We take it lightly. We say it's time to meet together and we join together. But to sit here and hear from God Himself and to not bow to that, right? And to not receive those words, that's the most dangerous place you could be. This individual is sitting among the assembly of the saints and he's in denial and he's saying that my way is right and God's way is wrong. He is not bowing to the truth. I would argue that this, and maybe that's not the best word, but I would, I would say that this individual in being unrepentant, that he is in a constant state of denial, he is not bowing to the word of God, and he's in the worst place he could be. And by the way, he knows the truth. It's not that he needs more gospel. He knows the gospel. This is a believer, right? This is a professing believer that has been among the, the assembly of the saints. He doesn't need more gospel. He needs to bow to the gospel that he knows. He needs to confess the sin and deal with it. Let it be exposed and get out. And so it, to sit here among that, he's like those in Romans 2.5. Y'all remember what it says? It says, after thy hardness and impenitent heart, in other words, your unrepentant heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. To sit here and sit under that week after week and not repent. Of that sin that is so obvious that everybody that the church has said very clearly, you are in a state of denial, you are in a state of sinfulness that needs to be repented. He's just heaping up wrath upon himself. He needs to bow what he already knows. I tried to imagine how would this work? How would this work if such an individual came into an assembly and we, it's clear we're supposed to separate, right? It's clear, no, with such a one, no not to eat. So there is a clear social separation between this individual and the rest of the church. What would that be like? You know, we're, that, that person walks by and we pretend they're not there. What, what kind of spirit would those type of services be like when you've got an individual there among the flock week after week that the church has put out? That the church has said, we're separated from you and, and you're no longer a part of this assembly. I just I can't imagine what the spirit of such a service would be week after week. I think that there needs to be a clear separation in saying you're not permitted back until that sin is confessed. We've taken this, we've been through all these steps and given you all these opportunities to repent of this sin and you have refused. And so now we don't have any choice but to make it public and say until you repent, you are put outside the church. It's not, it's not an easy thing. It's not something that we're happy about. In fact, we do this sorrowing. We do this weeping over this soul. But they have to understand they can't just come back. You, have you ever seen people that do that? There, there's some offense and they know that they did you wrong. But they just pretend it didn't happen, right? They won't talk to you for a couple of weeks and then they just come around and they pretend that everything's okay. The sin was never dealt with, right? The sin needs to be dealt with. This soul is in no better state. And so maybe they aren't actively in that sin anymore, but the sin wasn't confessed. And 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession needs to be there, right? Repentance needs to happen. Sometimes the responsibility is like Jesus told the disciples when he said, they said, don't you know that we've offended those Pharisees? He said, leave them alone. You remember that? They wanted to go back and smooth it over. He said, leave them alone. Second Corinthians chapter two. This is something, this is a hard thing here, but it's something that we need to understand concerning church discipline. This is the chapter here where the apostle says, this man that you cast out in 1 Corinthians, uh, in the, the first book, you know, the one that I instructed you to cast out in 1 Corinthians 5, he's come back now. And we know this man is repentant because of the language here in 2 Corinthians 2. 
Um, he, he says, uh, Sufficient to such a man, um, verse 6, is this punishment which was inflicted of many, so that contrary wise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch what? Sorrow. Sorrow. He's sorry, right? This is the language that's presented to us here. This person is sorry for that which he has done. And so the apostle says unequivocally, you are to receive this person back into fellowship and forgive him. He repented of the sin. It's gone. It's forgotten. Let's move on, right? It's not something to beat him up over and hold over his head. Welcome him back into fellowship now. He is truly sorry for this. Wherefore, I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. Right? Love cannot be abandoned, and we're going to see that at some point. But I want you to see in verse number 15, in this context of this same uh, topic, listen to what it says in verse number 15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? The Apostle Paul says, I understand something. As I am declaring the Word of God, two things are happening, right? It's a savor of death unto death to some. Some are going to be eternally separated and some are going to be eternally drawn to God. It's a savor of life unto life to others. That's just the way that it works, right? The Gospel has a twofold purpose. Some are going to be damned because of this truth and some are going to be saved because of this truth. And he says, we need to understand that we're not sufficient for these things. Well, Lord, what do I have to? What right do I have to be on the side that I'm the one that it's a savor of life unto life? It's just by Your grace. But we need to understand that some people are not going to be they're, they're not going to profit from this church discipline. In the context of this church discipline, he says, I want you to understand. For some, it's going to be a savor of life unto life, and others a savor of death unto death. And I want to show you an example of that in First Timothy chapter number one. First Timothy chapter number one. I believe that this is, that this is so serious that, that it's because of a lack of observing this commandment that you have a lot of the uh, carnal Christianity that we have today. It's because men won't deal with sin. And so what happens if you don't deal with sin that needs to be dealt with in the church? Well, all of a sudden now I can't preach on those topics, right? I mean, that, that brother or that sister sitting right there, and we know the sin and we haven't dealt with it. We haven't exposed it, so I'm just going to tiptoe around those verses. And so the gospel begins to be watered down. You begin to cut out the portions that you can't preach on. And now you've only got a semblance of Christianity. You're not faithfully uh, declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ, which, by the way, central to the gospel of Jesus Christ is repent. Right? And so listen to this in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Hymenaeus. Y'all remember Hymenaeus 1.20? We read that in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 20. Hymenaeus, he said, I had to put him and Alexander out. I've delivered them unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Did it work? It did not. Right? They were faithful to do the right thing, but it didn't take. Hymenaeus did not repent. And listen to what he says now at the end of Paul's life as he's about to die and he writes to Timothy. He has to warn concerning this Hymenaeus. And I want you to see what his doctrine is like and how detrimental it would have been to the church had he been permitted to be back in the assembly and yet unrepentant. And their word... Verse 16, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker. His doctrine is like a cancer. His doctrine is like a gangrene among the church. And if it's not purged out, if he's permitted to remain among you, it's going to affect, infect them all. I mean, if you've got tissue that's got cancer in it, you don't inject it back into the body, right? The, that tissue is not fit to go back in unless it's totally clear of all that. You don't put something in there to the detriment of the body. You remove that. And that's what their word will do. It will eat like a gangrene. It will eat like a cancer. Of whom is who? Hymenaeus. There he is. Here, all this time later, Hymenaeus never repented and came to the truth. And, and by the way, there's somebody that's joined him, Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. By the way, that Alexander that he delivered, it's likely he, it didn't work on him either. Look at verse 14 of chapter 4. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. I don't know for sure if this is the same Alexander, but it very well could be. 
And so this is what we need to understand, church. That's not our fault, right? We just need to be faithful in doing what God said. If a man or a woman won't repent, that's between them and the Lord. But we brought their sin to bear upon them. We put them in the best place to repent and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so we leave that with the Lord. But what we've got to be careful about is, is that doctrine. For someone to stay involved in sin and to live among the believers like as if that everything's okay, whether they're saying anything or not, that is a terrible testimony of Jesus Christ. And that false doctrine will eat like a cancer and a gangrene among you. We're out of time again. Guess what? We're not done. So I really, I really, I honestly mean this. I want to open this up for some comments. Um, we're out of time today. Lord willing, we will have time to do that next week. But please continue to pray concerning these things and to study it for yourself. And I welcome your thoughts on it.